Have you ever wondered why the priest wears what he wears for the celebration of Holy Mass? Priests, bishops, and deacons each wear distinct liturgical vestments for Mass and when performing other sacramental rites of the Church. Each of these vestments has a purpose and a history. In this episode of Catholic History Trek, Kevin and I will trek through the history of these liturgical vestments. God bless America. God love you. I want these to be my first words of greeting to you. They will be the concluding words on each broadcast. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Annuncio office. God remind you. Abemus Papam. You've embarked on a Catholic history trek. The word vestment is derived from similar sounding Old English, High German, and Old Norse words meaning to clothe or cover up. And that is what vestments do. They cover up the priest when performing the functions of the church, primarily offering the holy sacrifice of the mass. To clarify, in a future episode, Kevin and I will be trekking through the history of clerical clothing, things like cassocks and collars. In this episode, we'll be looking at the albs, chasubles, and stoles, which cover the clerical clothing. The Old Testament describes in great detail the priestly vestments of the high priests with their ephod, tunic, linen garment, mitre, and girdle, and it has sometimes been assumed that as the Catholic Church emerged out of the Old Covenant, her priestly vestments derived from these Jewish origins. But it seems this was not the case. Instead, Catholic priestly vestments originated with the secular dress of the Greco-Roman world. The first era of liturgical dress, that of the first few centuries of Christianity, saw Catholic priests simply dressing in the secular clothing of the day with no unique liturgical vestments, which was understandable given the nature of the church as illegal and persecuted at the time. And even though their clothing was not unique to their office, it is believed these earliest priests would wear their better garments, sort of a Sunday best, when performing their priestly duties. After the legalization of Christianity, certain articles of clothing began to be specified for liturgical purposes, a development believed to have moved earlier and faster in the East, and then followed up in the West. These vestments, for the most part, were generally very simple in their style and decoration, and special blessings were introduced for the donning of each vestment, a tradition that continues today. By the dawning of the Carolingian era, there were about 11 or 12 vestments in use, as detailed by Amalarius of Metz, but that number increased by about 50% by the pontificate of Pope Innocent III only a few centuries later. Certain vestments also began to be worn by the minor orders. Check out episode 14 for the history on the minor orders. And other stately vestments were worn only by bishops and the Pope, reflecting their importance in both ecclesiastical and secular affairs. From the 13th century up to the present time, the church's vestments have remained unchanged in number, although they have seen notable adjustments to their form, fit, and appearance. Basically, richer materials, more ornamentation, and better fitting to make them more functional. A priest traditionally wears six vestments to offer the sacrifice of the Mass. The order of vesting is first the amos, and then the alb, cincture, maniple, stole, and then the chasuble. So, Kevin and I will start with these. The amos is a short, square, or rectangular linen cloth, about two feet by three feet, which covers the shoulders. Generally, it's made of a flax or hemp fiber with a cross sewn in the middle and a pair of strings to tie it in place. It originally also covered the head, as evidenced by the beginning of the vesting prayer Impose the Lord the Helmet of Salvation on my head. The Amis began to appear in some 9th century text regarding the vestments of the priest for Mass, with its naming of Amis seemingly originating from a word for a linen wrap worn over the shoulders. It's believed to have been introduced for a utilitarian purpose, but the exact reason is lost to history. Presumably, it was either a neck cloth to hide the bare throat, 
a scarf to protect the throat in cold weather, or a barrier to protect the rich vestments from perspiration. The amice, symbolic of protection from the devil's assaults, has become an optional vestment for priests celebrating the new 1960s Mass created by Pope Paul VI, but remains in use for the Latin Mass. Over the amice is the alb, which is a long white linen vestment with full-length sleeves. Historically, the alb has been called many things, including the linea, tunica linea, ponderis, tunica talaris, camisia, and alba, which were all names describing it as the material it was made from, its shirt-like shape, the white color, and reaching to the ankles. Alba, meaning white, is the name which survives today. The vesting prayer asked the priest to cleanse the priest's heart, with white being symbolic of purity, as seen in baptismal garments. In years past, newly baptized Christians wore their white baptismal garments from Holy Saturday until Low Sunday. That's the second Sunday of Easter. This garment, named the albi, was not the same thing as the priest's alb. The origin of the priest's liturgical alb is something for speculation, as several synods and saints as early as the 4th century mention the alb, but white linen tunics were typical clothing in both Roman and Greek culture, so it's unknown for sure if these mentions were just generic or if they were specifying the priest's liturgical alb. The first definitive mention of the alb came in the year 818 when the Benedictine abbot and archbishop Blessed Maris Magnetius Rabanus listed the alb among the priestly vestments for mass, describing its shape and material as still in use today. From its introduction, all clerics wore the alb, those in the major orders and the minor orders. But around the middle of the 12th century, those in the minor orders began to wear a surplus instead of the alb, but more on the surplus later. The next item, the cincture, is a simple wool cord to confine the loose flowing alb. As its name indicates, it's essentially a belt, as cincture is derived from the Latin cingulum, meaning belt. As reflected in the cincture's vesting prayer, it is a belt of purity to girt the loins, as mentioned in 1 Peter. It has been around since at least the 9th century, although originally only worn by bishops and priests, it is now also worn by deacons. Up through the late Middle Ages, this belt was sometimes richly decorated with embroidery and bands of silk. Today, it is a simple woven cord, although it often retains a bit of this decoration with tassels at the ends. The next vestment, the maniple, is a band hung over the left forearm of the priest about three feet long and two to four inches wide. Typically made of silk, its color, like the chasuble, matches the liturgical feast of the day. More on that later, too. It was originally folded and carried in the left hand, used by people of rank, and is also associated with the handkerchief used by laborers to wipe away perspiration from their labors. The maniple's vesting prayer speaks to this ancient connection between the maniple and work, in this case, the priest's work of offering the sacrifice of the Mass, as the prayer says, that I may joyfully receive the reward of my labors. Its naming of maniple is also related with work, as maniple comes from the Latin manus, for hand, which gives us words like manufacture, which comes from manus and factura, meaning to make by hand. The maniple first appeared at Rome in the early 6th century and became a common vestment across the Western Church by the 9th century. Art depicts early maniples held in the left hand, which would greatly limit the priest's ability to handle the sacred vessels and the Eucharist at Mass, so it was eventually moved from being held in the hand to being wrapped around the left wrist and forearm. Historically, outside of a few exceptions, it was worn at Mass by all the major orders, priests, deacons, and subdeacons, but none of the minor orders. The maniple, like the amice, became an optional vestment for priests offering the new Mass, but the maniple can still be found by priests saying the Latin Mass. And speaking of the Latin Mass, if you attend one, pay attention to the maniple, and you'll notice that the priest removes it when he delivers the sermon, and then puts it back on when he returns to the altar. This is because the sermon is sort of a break from the work of offering the Holy Sacrifice. 
The next vestment, the stole, is a strip of material about 2 to 4 inches wide by 80 inches long. It's generally made of silk or a similar material. The stole is worn by bishops, priests, and deacons, and only used at functions unique to their office, such as celebrating Mass, handling the Blessed Sacrament, and administering the sacraments. Outside of Mass, it's probably most recognizable as the long purple strip worn by a priest when hearing confessions. At Mass, it is worn differently by the different major orders. Deacons wear it like a sash over the left shoulder. Bishops wear it across the back of the neck and down both sides in front of them. And priests also wear it across the back of the neck and down the front of them, but sometimes cross it at the breast in the form of an X. The stole originated as a vestment for deacons in the East as early as the 4th and 5th centuries, while priests in the East are not mentioned with the stole until about the 8th century. Although in the West, it was mentioned in the 6th and 7th centuries as something that had long been in use. By the 9th century, it became a standard vestment for priests both East and West. And although the stole is derived from the Roman scarf or handkerchief called the aurarium, the name stole is Gallic in origin. Several theories have been proposed for the stole's origin as a liturgical vestment. Two former theories, which are often rejected, is that it was a carryover of the Jewish prayer mantle, or it was an ornamental trimming of a larger garment, which had since been discarded. The most favorable theory has it as the aurarium neckcloth, which was worn as a badge of distinction and was originally worn by the higher orders of the clergy who were ordained in Rome. And the most conspicuous of all the priestly vestments for Mass is the chasuble, the top layer which covers all the rest. Its name chasuble comes to us from the Latin word casa for cottage or hut, as the chasuble covers and houses the entire person. At least the early chasubles did. The earliest chasubles were simply an adaptation of common secular attire worn throughout the Roman Empire, and were no more than a large circular piece of cloth with a hole in the middle for one's head to pass through, sort of like a thick poncho. Some early chasubles had a hood sewn in them, presumably for processions, although by the 10th century, the cope replaced the hooded chasuble. These earliest chasubles were quite inconvenient for the celebration of Mass, as the entire front of the vestment had to be lifted every time the priest needed to use his arms, which perhaps gives rise to a section of its vesting prayer, which goes, Make me able to bear this. Because of this difficulty of bearing the chasuble, it became the duty of the deacon and subdeacon to help lift and roll back the chasuble for the priest. And a remnant of this can still be seen today in the Latin Mass when the altar boys raise the back part of the priest's chasuble during the elevation of the Eucharist. Over the centuries, chasubles became more utilitarian in their design. The large circle shape became more elliptical, with the sides of the chasuble becoming shorter and smaller, while the front and back retained their overall length. And one short-lived medieval innovation to remedy the difficulty of using the circular chasubles was to insert a cord with rings inside the chasuble and then draw its sides like curtains, but this was the rare exception. By the 18th century, the continued reduction of the chasuble's width produced the Roman chasuble, popularly called the fiddleback, so named because the extra material removed for the ease of arm movement resulted in the shape of the front of the chasuble, which sort of looks like a fiddle. Today, one will often spot this fiddleback chasuble worn by priests at the traditional Latin Mass, while priests celebrating the new Mass often vest in a flowing Gothic-style chasuble. Regardless of the chasuble style, its color, as with the maniple, matches the liturgical season or office of the day. And to insufficiently summarize the different colors you'll see, white is used for feasts of our Lord and most of the saints who aren't martyrs, Red is for Pentecost and the Feast of Saints who are Martyrs. Violet is for Advent and Lent. Black is for Good Friday and Requiem Masses. And Green is for the gaps between the various feasts, often labeled as Ferias or Ordinary Time. We'll now look at some vestments that are particular to certain orders of the clergy. The first is the surplice, which Scott mentioned briefly earlier. 
It's a white half-length tunic with large open sleeves. In the traditional altar boy uniform, this is the white garment that goes over the usually black cassock. It's a vestment more commonly seen in tradition-oriented liturgies, as it is worn, for example, by priests participating in choir rather than concelebrating, and in traditional liturgies such as benediction. But it is also used in the administration of sacraments outside Mass, the hearing of confession, the conferring of baptism. As this summary indicates, it's kind of a jack-of-all-trades vestment, though we include it in this clergy-specific category because it's used solely by what used to be known as the lower clergy, that is, those below the rank of bishop, priests, and, when the minor orders existed, porters, acolytes, and so forth. The surplus appears to have developed in northern Europe, France, or England in the Middle Ages. The geography of its genesis has a bearing on the term itself, from the Latin super pellicae, over fur. That is, the vestment was worn over the fur clothing that the clergy wore in these northern climes. From there, the surplus spread throughout the Western Church, gradually evolving from the more substantial medieval garment to the more ceremonial and decorative version most common today. A variation on the surplus is the cotta, which was preferred in some regions. It served the same liturgical function, but was of slightly different form, shorter at the waist and sleeves. Like the surplus, the term Dalmatic is of geographical origin, deriving from Dalmatia, the region on the eastern shore of the Adriatic Sea, roughly the modern nation of Croatia. Yes, the Dalmatian dog breed is similarly derived. The Dalmatic is not a white garment with black spots, though. Instead, it's a large robe open at the sides, which can be of various liturgical colors and designs. Often, it has two parallel vertical bars called clavi, usually connected by a crossbar. It's been in use since early times. One account indicates that Pope Sylvester, in the early 300s, conferred it on Roman deacons. Today, it's often associated with deacons because it is the outer vestment worn by them during Mass. But it's also proper to bishops and the Pope, who used to wear it underneath the chasuble for solemn Masses, though since Vatican II, this is no longer common practice. The next set of vestments are all exclusive to the bishop. As a group, these are often called episcopal vestments, pontifical vestments, or simply pontificals. Generally speaking, vestments proper to the bishop would also apply to the pope, who is, after all, a bishop, as well as other higher clergy, such as cardinals, who are usually, but not always, bishops, and also abbots, to whom apply many of the same privileges and responsibilities as those pertaining to bishops. The first garment we're looking at is the tunic, or tunicle. It has varied in form over the centuries and from place to place, but tends to be similar to the dalmatic, a large covering garment that drapes across the torso, sometimes with open sleeves, sometimes without sleeves altogether. In fact, it was known as the dalmatica minor, a small dalmatic, and was described in one account as sort of a midway garment between the alb and the dalmatic. The tunic, like some other vestments, as Scott has already indicated, began its life as a regular secular garment and was gradually adopted for liturgical use. Its use as a clerical vestment dates possibly to the 6th century when it was associated with the office of subdeacon, one of the now defunct minor orders that Scott covered back in his episode 14. The tunic became an episcopal vestment as well during the Middle Ages, worn under the dalmatic which in turn is under the chasuble, so not very visible. After the Second Vatican Council, the tunic, like the dalmatic, was no longer required for bishops celebrating Mass. Pontifical vestments are comprehensive, head to foot, and the Episcopal feet, at least prior to Vatican II, would be clothed in the Episcopal sandals. In the Tridentine period, the so-called sandals were in form more like what we would call slippers or loafers, though the use of sandals by clerics reaches back to the 5th or 6th century when they were actual sandals. Over the course of the Middle Ages, the liturgical sandal became identified with the higher clergy, bishops, cardinals, and popes. The upper part of the sandal was usually embroidered silk or velvet and gold in color. Again, Episcopal sandals fell out of use after Vatican II, so you'll probably only see them today, if at all, in traditionalist settings. Inside the Episcopal sandal, the Episcopal foot, would be covered in the Episcopal stocking, also known as a buskin. The defining mark of the buskin is that its color would match the liturgical color of the Mass, 
with the exception of black, because pontifical footwear was not used for requiem masses. Common during the Middle Ages and Tridentine period, the buskin went the way of the sandal after Vatican II. With the feet covered, we now move to the hands. The vast majority of Catholics will never see a bishop clothed in Episcopal gloves. Again, they'll probably only be found in traditionalist settings at this point. Yet they were more common prior to Vatican II, at pontifical high masses only, when the bishops donned ornate hand coverings to match the liturgical color of the day, doffing them at the offertory, when, practically speaking, the dexterity of the fingers was needed to handle the sacred vessels in the body of Christ, and, symbolically speaking, hands, like heads, were supposed to be uncovered as a sign of respect. The formal title, the Latin derived from the Greek, was chirothica, meaning hand covering. Gloves were in use in Rome by the 10th century and earlier, possibly 6th century, in other places such as France. It became common to ornament the back of the glove with embroidered symbols such as the cross, the Lamb of God, or saints. As with many such vestments, the usual material was silk, though other threads were also used. The normal color seems to have been white through the Middle Ages, the custom of employing liturgical colors developing in the 16th century. One final piece of Episcopal garb is more common and more prominent, the elaborate head covering known as the mitre. The term derives from a Greek word that came to mean headdress. The mitre remains in common usage not only among Roman Catholic bishops, but also across the Orthodox and other Eastern churches and other ecclesial bodies that preserve the office of bishops, such as Anglicans and Lutherans, though it takes different forms in some of these churches. In Catholicism, the normal structure is a tall hat with front and back pieces both rising to a peak and with two lappets or pendants hanging from the back. There are various origin theories for the mitre. Possibly it developed from the headwear worn by officials in the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. Another account says that it derives from the tradition of a crown of some kind being worn by high priests in Judaism, and that this was adopted early on by Christian bishops. There is solid evidence of its use for bishops from the 11th century, and by the middle of the 12th century it had become almost universal in the Western Church. Beyond the basic shape, the appearance of mitres is extremely diverse. While white is the foundational color, and a simple white mitre is used for certain occasions, such as funerals, the decorative possibilities for other mitres are nearly infinite. Some kind of gold ornamentation is most common, and varieties of crosses are also usual. But many other kinds of designs can also be used, and liturgical colors can be included to match the mitre to the season or feast. Traditionally, the style of mitre used for the most solemn occasions would often be truly splendid, for example, encrusted with precious gems. The mitre is so prominently associated with the bishop that it has become virtually a symbol of the episcopal office. The bishop piece in the game of chess, for example, is topped with a stylized mitre. With the discontinuation of the use of the papal tiara, that's another Scott episode, episode number 75, the mitre has also become closely associated with the papacy. Both Benedict XVI and Francis used a mitre as the crowning image on their pontifical coats of arms. The dress of a bishop and an archbishop are going to be very similar, but the archbishop does have one distinctive vestment, the pallium. From the Latin word for a woolen cloak, the pallium is a white woolen band draped over the shoulders. Within this description, it has historically taken a few different configurations, but the current design is a kind of strap across both shoulders with single lappets hanging in the front and back and six black crosses placed against the white background. The origin of the pallium is shrouded in mystery, neither the nature nor the date of its origin is known. An array of theories regarding its source include a garment of the Jewish high priest, investiture with a garment by early Christian Roman emperors, and an early papal vestment. Tertullian refers to the pallium in the early 200s, but the first documented use for a bishop is in the early 300s. By the early 7th century, its usage appears to have become common. At that time, it was a mark of distinction conferred by the Pope, often used for bishops but not restricted to archbishops. Eventually, the conferral of the pallium was reserved for archbishops or metropolitans, that is, ordinaries whose jurisdictions are ecclesiastical provinces. I guess we need a separate episode on this terminology, but to use one example, the ecclesiastical province of Cincinnati encompasses the state of Ohio all five dioceses plus the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. So the jurisdiction of the Archbishop of Cincinnati is the whole state, though this 
jurisdiction is mostly ceremonial, and each bishop exercises full authority in his own diocese. The pallium symbolizes the archbishops sharing in the pope's authority. A particular tradition also developed regarding the crafting of the pallium. Trappist monks raise the sheep whose wool will be used. On January 21st of each year, two lambs are blessed by the Pope. January 21st is the Feast of St. Agnes. Agnes being Agnus, lamb in Latin. The lambs grow into sheep, their fleece is shorn, and the wool is used to create the palliums for that year. On June 29th, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, the vestments are presented to the newly appointed archbishops. Finally, we have the highest of the higher clergy, the Pope. As I've indicated along the way, some of the lower clergy vestments and most of the Episcopal vestments are also worn by the Pope. But there are still a couple that are unique to the Pope. The first is the subsinctorium. This vestment is similar to the maniple, which Scott already described, only a bit wider. Its name is due to the fact that it attaches to the cincture. It was originally white or red, but later adopted liturgical colors, and it also displays a cross and an image of the Lamb of God. Reference to it can be found as early as the 10th century, and during the medieval period it was worn by bishops in general. As with some other vestments, it seems to have originated in France and spread from there. By the 16th century, its use was restricted to the Pope and the bishops of northern Italy. Today it is used by the Pope alone, with one exception. The Patriarch of Lisbon can also wear it. Don't ask me why. The Archdiocese of Lisbon was raised to the rank of a Patriarchate in the early 1700s, and at that time, the patriarch was granted ceremonial privileges similar to the pope. I presume there were some political reasons for this oddity, but I haven't looked into it. Another possible future episode. We've now reached my final vestment, but don't go away. Scott has a couple more bonus items. The papal fanon, spelled just like the surname of the famous Afro-Caribbean Marxist philosopher, is a circular cape that goes over the shoulders and around the neck of the pope. It's made of silk, white, and gold-striped, and is worn only by the Pope and only at pontifical masses. Though again, the Patriarch of Lisbon is the exception. In fact, since Vatican II, its use has been very rare. Pope Francis, according to Wikipedia, has never worn it, and even the more traditionalist Benedict wore it infrequently. It dates at least to the 8th century, though like other vestments, it was used by bishops generally at first. It became a Pope-only vestment by the end of the 12th century, and its use has always been limited to solemn high masses. In earlier centuries, it was square in shape. It became circular sometime in the 16th or 17th century. The vestments Kevin and I have mentioned so far can be seen at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, but there are additional liturgical vestments which are used outside of Mass. A couple of these, the cope and the humeral veil, are both used for processions. The cope is a full-length sleeveless cloak, or liturgical mantle. It's very similar to the earliest chasubles, except instead of being fully enclosed, the cope is open down the middle and fastened with a clasp. Originally called a kappa, the cope was the inspiration for the kappa clausa, a cope sewn shut in the middle and used as an outdoor garment, the copa crales, a black choir cloak worn by cantors, and the kappa magna, essentially a more glorified kappa crales. The oldest copes sported a hood, and the only change in the cope's design over the past thousand plus years has been this hood becoming a non-functioning ornamental appendage. Copes appeared by the 7th or 8th century simply as a hooded cloak for monks, but eventually became monastic choir dress. Perhaps inspired by northern Europe's colder climates, by the 12th century they gained widespread liturgical use and were worn by all ranks of the clergy. For priests and bishops, they were worn on occasions when the chasuble was not worn, such as processions, consecrations, solemn vespers, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, and the aspergis before Mass. In this last example, aspergis before Mass, that's sprinkling of holy water, the priest would wear the cope for the sprinkling of holy water and then switch to the chasuble to celebrate Mass. Another non-Mass vestment is the humeral veil. It is a rectangular silk cloth 8 feet long by 1.5 feet wide, with either the name of Jesus or an image adorning its center. It is worn covering the upper back and shoulders, over the upper arms, and hangs down the front, hence the name of humeral veil, since it's worn over the humerus, which is also called the funny bone, but 
I don't think they'd want to call it the funny veil. Like the coat, it's fastened with a clasp across the breast so it doesn't fall off. In ancient days, it was worn by all acolytes who handled the sacred vessels during the Mass. Its use was first recorded in the oldest Roman Ordo, which dates to the early 8th century, as something worn by the subdeacon, although it was called a syndon in Roman Ordo No. 1. Later in the Middle Ages, the humeral veil also began to be worn by the acolyte who held the bishop's mitre at a pontifical mass, and by the close of the Middle Ages, it was being used in processions of the Blessed Sacrament. It's this use in Eucharistic processions for which the humeral veil is most recognizable today. Pockets are often sewn into the ends of the veil so that when the priest holds an object with the veil, such as the monstrance, he's actually holding the item with the pocket and not with the veil itself. This is done simply to preserve the richly ornate vestment from wearing out and from needing to be replaced. So we come to the end of this trek into sartorial history and tradition, hoping you haven't gotten lost under the heaps of silk and embroidery. All these details of dress make our experience of the liturgy richer and more colorful, and not merely in an aesthetic sense. In the words of the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the purpose of a variety of color of the sacred vestments is to give effective expression even outwardly to the specific character of the mysteries of faith being celebrated, and to a sense of Christian life's passage through the course of the liturgical year. Vestments also highlight the variety of callings in the church, the diversity and unity that is the body of Christ. The Roman Missal again. This variety of offices in the celebration of the Eucharist is shown outwardly by the diversity of sacred vestments, which should therefore be a sign of the office proper to each minister. And finally, the Council of Trent expands on this rationale. Though the habit does not make the monk, it said, the clergy nevertheless should always wear clothes which suit the order they have received, and the honor and purity of their morals should be reflected in the exterior decency of their attire. Even if their character and appearance have changed over time, these are the enduring purposes of liturgical vestments, maniples, buskins, copes, and all the rest. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicutrat in principio et nunc et semper, et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com. <laughs>